Welcome to Plato's Cave. I'm Jordan Myers, and I'll be a master's student in philosophy at the University of Houston in just a few months. You're listening to the very first reading group episode of the show. So in this episode, we begin a series about free will and moral responsibility. Uh, I discuss the book Free Will by Sam Harris with two friends, Adam and Giffen, because philosophy shouldn't just be for philosophers. And so in the intro to this episode, uh, we use Sam Harris's book because it's a good introduction to free will, moral responsibility, uh, determinism. It's not too detailed uh, to the point where you can't understand what's going on, but obviously we get deeper as the series goes on. Now, the interesting thing is that I begin as a more of a hard determinist, and you'll understand what that means in a minute. Um, but I move throughout the series to become more of a certain type of compatibilist. Uh, Adam and I converge in that direction, while Giffen remains very uh, reductionistic and skeptical of responsibility generally. So you'll see over the course of the series how our positions change and or move. And so this is the first of uh, a multi-part series on free will and moral responsibility, which is one of my um, biggest interests and something that I hope to study a lot more of at the University of Houston. If you're familiar with Plato's Cave generally, you'll know that I've also been speaking to many professors uh, and philosophers who have written um, recently or in the past about free will, moral responsibility, the reactive attitudes, determinism, etc. So this is a long-standing interest of mine, and this episode was actually recorded over a year ago. Uh, so it is a an old conversation and one that I have moved from. Um, I've changed my position from the one I espouse in this episode. But with that introduction in mind, I hope that you enjoy this upcoming series. I know that this was uh, something that I really enjoyed recording uh, with some very old and very good friends of mine. So with that introduction, let's get into the series. Quick note, the first three episodes of this series are audio only. Uh, that will change as the series goes on. So if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, video will begin after the third episode. If you're listening on an RSS feed, well, this doesn't matter. Okay, so we're going to uh, so we're going to open up the free will series by doing, I guess, a partial book review of uh, of Sam Harris's Free Will. It's a really short book. It's, it's uh, less than a hundred pages. Yeah, it's about seventy five pages published in I think two thousand and fourteen. So one of his later pub two thousand and twelve, one of his later publications. I don't know. I remember I came across this book. I think I read it for the first time my sophomore year of high school, or uh, I'm sorry, of uh, college. So it would have been right around um, four years ago. And I remember this was kind of one of my first introductions into the area of free will. And I found it very interesting, very persuasive. And I thought it was a good book. I thought it was a great book at the time. I still think it's a good book now. But it, it definitely kicked off kind of my interest in this area. And neither of you guys had read any of this before now, right? Correct. Okay. I think I heard like a um, clip of, you know, Sam Harris talking before on the subject of free will. But it was like a vague memory. Okay, okay. Um, so yeah, so I chose this cause we're going to do a series on, on this topic and it's going to obviously kind of grow and, and wind as it does. But I thought this was a good introduction because he lays out, you know, a lot of the ideas that we're going to go over in non-philosophical jargonish way. He, he really keeps the, uh, he really keeps the language very accessible. And, uh, and so I think it's a good way to start off, uh, the topic. So well, I guess, first of all, what did you guys just think of the, the book itself, flat out? I know we didn't read the whole thing. We read the first, what, 47 pages of a 75-page book? Did you guys like it, hate it? Loved it. It was easy <laughs> reading, and, you know, he's a great writer. Um, I honestly openly laughed at points because... There know, were some funny ones, yeah. yeah he's, he's, he's a fun guy, and he's very clear, um, just a good writer. It was completely readable to someone who... with like no experience exploring free will. Um, mm. And, you know, his points were made. He would, you know, kind of open, like he would propose kind of like statements and then natural questions that would arise, he would tackle immediately. 
Mm. Um, and with with like you know humor that like contributed and didn't detract. Yeah, it's a, it's a Great. it's a rare skill to to not kind of dodge with humor. It's it's often a it's often a uh, it's really a dodgy tactic by a lot of people I've noticed. But all right, so we're gonna move through the first uh, for the first you know forty seven pages or so more or less systematically obviously if i skip over anything that you guys think was interesting stop me um but he he opens up the book in a very provocative way as harris is wont to do so he tells the story of you know uh, these two these two uh criminals stephen haynes and joshua commissar jeffsky and they're you know two career criminals and he tells this you know kind of haunting story of them breaking into a house of them beating up and and tying up a uh, a man and assaulting and raping his wife and daughters ages 17 and 11 so it's really it's a hard story to read and they they go uh, you know and and withdraw money from the wife's account at at ransom and they burn down the house afterwards killing the wife and and kids and he escaped and obviously has to live with the aftermath and, you know, he he opens up, you know, with this obviously just really horrific story. And then he asks a rhetorical question after telling us this. He says this on page four. Um, he says, if I had truly been in uh, the criminal's shoes, I'm not going to try to pronounce that name again, on July 23rd, 2007, That is, if I had his genes and life experience and identical brain or soul in an identical state, I would have acted exactly as he did. There is simply no intellectually respectable position from which to deny this. The role of luck, therefore, appears decisive. So the first question that obviously is, is relevant is, do we accept that statement? That if he had been, it's almost a tautology, but I don't think it is. The question is like, it sounds tautological if you frame it as if he were identical to either criminal, would he have acted in that way? And so, I mean, obviously, I fully accept that. There's no basis to to say, like, you know, if you were not replaced atom by atom or, you know, cell by cell or gene by gene, you know, whatever you want to do, then you would not be the exact same person at that point and do the same thing, right? Yeah, I think he was just trying to banish the kind of, like, freaky friday perception of like the question that people might have like you know like your brain like kind of just like woo, and then suddenly you're like you know in their body but a no, ghost I, in the machine yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so the interesting thing is that i mean you know he 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 introduces here and he doesn't he, it's not you know explicitly brought up but we'll talk about it in a in a bit there's this problem that he kind of introduces of could have done otherwise and He also introduces, you know, the composition problem, which is, you know, basically put, if none of who you are can be owned, do you have any sense of free will? And both of these are brought up well by the example. So he says uh, on the next page, uh, this is where he kind of, you know, pulls off the curtain on his thesis in the book. He says, free will is an illusion. Our wills are simply not of our own making. Thoughts and intentions emerge from background causes of which we are unaware and over which we exert no conscious control. We do not have the freedom we think we have. So this is this is where it gets a little bit descriptive instead of normative. But like, I'm just curious, like before, uh, maybe before reading this and also after if it changed, what sort of freedom do you guys think you have? <laughs> Because he says, you know, I mean, he he is writing this like to the lay person. So he says, you know, we do not have the freedom we think we have. So I'm just curious, like, like either of you guys, what freedom do you think you have? Um, <laughs> I would say, I mean, I'm, I, I, here's where I'm kind of at. I think this will be more or less exposed, whether it's true or not. <laughs> readings, But I think that I can't control where intentions come from attention intentions just emerge but i think you know given who i am which i also can't control who i am will naturally discern between different intentions and i think that i have control over that in that sense not who i am um Mm. because who i am is determined but who i am at that stage then i have 
I can discern between different intentions that arise. That's kind of where I'm at. Interesting. And that was that was the case before and after the reading, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Giffen, what about you? Um, <laughs> it's I, a weird question to be asked, isn't it? Like, yeah. what kind of freedom do you think you have? <laughs> yeah. So, I don't even. This might be kind of outside the scope of your question a little bit because it kind of gets into like the whole thesis. But it's like I feel like on a day to day basis, like that I have like you know, as Adam, Adam said, you know, things arise in my head, like situations arise in like the environment. And like, I feel like the kind of capacity, like I have a thought like, oh, maybe I'll do this. And I, I take a step to the left and I'm like, oh, wait, no, this is probably the better move. And I make a step to the right. Um, so I, I feel that, um, you know, daily. Um, but in terms of like, <laughs> how free am I? Not at all. Or like, what type of freedom do you think you have? So it's so, so you like an experiential freedom almost. Like you, you yeah, almost like live I, I, as if I, you were free. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Okay. But I mean, so, so then I guess maybe, maybe that's not like the, the proper, maybe there's like more to like that classification that I'm missing, but I feel like a sense of freedom in like the presentation, but I don't, I, but I mean, ultimately even like the, um, like what comes into my mind, no control. I mean, I don't even have a really control ultimately. It's like upon in, in inspection on what I end up like, you know, quote unquote choosing. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I think off the bat, the three of us all are already in a small subset of people who will admit that we sort of have no, no freedom from a 30,000 foot view, you know, like if you're just kind of if you're looking at yourself kind of from an external perspective or objectively. I, I don't know about you guys, but it's my experience that sort of the pre-philosophical person or the or the lay person does actually want to somehow claim some sort of control over something, right? I mean, people will will often say like, like yeah, you know, I have the freedom to to do otherwise, for instance, or to do what I intend to do, or you know, I'm I'm free. It's like you know, you'll you'll find a lot of this in kind of common sense morality you know talks with people is that you know it's like you know i'm responsible for my actions that's like a super common thing that like i'm sure we've all heard our parents or grandparents say you know you're responsible for your actions or i'm responsible for my actions mm -hmm. and and i guess on on page six like harris um he does get into the popular conception which i'm calling the pre-philosophical or lay notion of free will which which in my experience, I don't know what the actual, you know, kind of like sampling is on this, but, but most people do seem to have some sort of libertarian free will, which is that you sort of have, there's kind of two assumptions. And I don't understand fully, because I don't hold this view, I don't understand if both of these are necessary and sufficient, or if either one of these would kind of hold on its own, right? So Harris says, there's two assumptions. One that each of us could have behaved differently than we did in the past, and two, that we are the conscious source of most of our thoughts and actions in the present. As we are about to see, however, both of these assumptions assumptions are false. I don't know, what, do, do you guys agree with me that I, I do think actually just the, the mid, over 50% of people with no philosophical training would believe those two statements to be true about themselves? Yeah, I go even way higher than 50 percent, honestly. Sure. I was saying just like, I don't know what it is, but it's a majority. Yeah, no, I mean, just I if if you had to like put me at a number, I'd go as high as like 90 percent. Like, I really mm. think that most people would be like, absolutely. And yeah. it's kind of it is like very heavily ingrained in like our culture, like mm -hmm. in, in broadly in the West and in, to some extent, like penetrating most of the world. Well, it also is. I mean, H Harris actually almost nicely really doesn't doesn't really talk too much about religion in this book i mean he mentions it offhand i think in a couple places but like yeah i mean religion plays a huge role in people believing that i mean the notion <laughs> of like a, you know a soul for instance or that you know god gives us the ability to act with free will i mean it makes yes, no god sense god gave us free will <laughs> alone is a statement which like you know 60 percent of americans would believe so i mean i also from that <laughs> I mean, I also think, though, honestly, that when you ask people this, divorced, you, you kind of don't even hint that religion is at, at, at play here. Mm -hmm. Even then, I think the majority of people, sort of irrespective of their religious views, would sign off to these two statements. 
Agreed. I mean, it also forms kind of a basis of our like political and legal philosophy that's been developed like since the Greeks. So, I mean, <laughs> yes, whether you yeah. divorce like culture from religion entirely, you still get the same kind of majority or super majority who would agree, I think. Mm-hmm. Now, this is I'm I because I, I Giffen, your your sort of experience of having acting as if you have free will is is interesting and I want to explore it. And and Harris follows up the, my initial statement with with another one. Uh, on page six, he says, but the deeper truth is that free will doesn't even correspond to any subjective fact about us. An introspection soon provides a host, uh, pr- proves as hostile to the view as laws of physics are. Seeming acts of volition merely arise spontaneously, whether caused, uncaused, or probabilistically inclined, it makes no difference and cannot be traced to a point of origin in our conscious minds. A moment or two of serious self-scrutiny, and you might observe that you no more decide the next thought you think than the next thought I write. And so I, I just had the question, um, like, what do we experience? Do we feel like we have some sort of freedom now? And Giffen, you already explicitly answered that. But Adam, since since you didn't uh, default to answering that question, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I would say that I, I think, I don't know. I still preserve a little bit of, like, the free will aspect to it. I don't know, because like for me at least, like it feels like almost like we don't control our thoughts. Like there's no question about that. Like they just arise. Mm. But at that point, they seem to sort of like bounce off kind of conscious experience at that point, and you have kind of a certain reaction, positive or negative, to them, and you don't control that reaction to it. But I mean, that is who we are. Like we are our conscious like experience. Mm. So I think like. You know, it's it's almost like, I don't know, a little bit like reductive at that point to say like, oh, OK, well, you can't control who you are. It's like that's true. But at the same time, who I am is kind of reflecting on thoughts that appear in my mind at that point. Mm. And I can then act upon those because it's like, OK, say like I have a. I don't know, like an immoral thought pops in my head. One that I would recognize as immoral based on sort of the like moral constructs that I've put in place, right? And I have like a negative reaction to it once I like, you know, it appears consciously in my head. Mm. At that point, like it's now bouncing off my conscious experience of that thought. So therefore I won't act upon it even though I don't control my reaction to it. In a sense, hmm. do you get what I'm saying there? I get I mean, what you're saying. Yeah, I, for me, yeah. like, you know, like that still preserves some aspect of free will for me. I don't know. I get what you're saying, and I, I realize I don't, I don't want to do the unfair thing of uh, of only playing with your guys's cards on the table. So I'll, I'll give my answer to this as well. I think, I think, because it looks like we have an, actually a nice spectrum here. So I, I would put myself at the far end of the other side of the spectrum. I guess opposite Giffen, and it seems it like is. Adam, you're. <laughs> so so I'm I'm I sign off on basically everything that Adam said, but with a few distinctions, and I think the distinctions are important. So I, like any person on Earth, live kind of experiencing what Harris calls you know the illusion of free will. Some you know most of the time obviously something like 90 something percent of the time right but whenever i whenever i actually just happen to introspect at all or notice anything i am immediately confronted with the experiential reality so like i i get all the conceptual arguments and everything too but but just the experiential evidence of an utter and total lack of anything resembling free will it's not even in just the moments that I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to do it now. And it's just like, I don't, I ha, it is inexplicable to me how I choose any word to even say to you guys right now. Like I'm, I'm choosing the words. Like, why did I just say I'm twice there? Do you know what I mean? Like I have absolutely no position to understand why. And I have no position to understand why. I'm saying the sentence that I'm saying now as opposed to any other string of words I could be stringing together. And when I make a grammatical error, as I probably just did, I, that just comes over me. 
like I, I don't I don't experience choosing those words. Like I almost experience uh, saying or finding out what I'm about to say at the same time you guys are. But if I'm not paying attention, which you obviously can't be for ninety nine percent of life, you're just doing things right. Like then then I do slip back into the illusion of like yeah I'm I'm doing this in my own free will or whatever. It seems like I'm doing that. But I guess the difference between me and Giffen and maybe me and Adam, I'm not sure, is that uh, any moment that I have that is closer to the introspective side of life is synonymous with just the obliteration of any idea of free will. Um, and, and And I think we can get into this more as we go through the book, but... Does that make sense? At least have I explained explained myself semi coherently? I'm not 100 percent sure how that sits us on the opposite end of the spectrum, but I think I understood like at least your argument a little okay. bit. Am I misunderstanding what you said then? So it's not even an argument. Yeah, um, it was closer to you actually. I thought I was the one farther. Yeah. Away. I thought yeah. Wait, did you did you cut out for me, Giffen or something? I thought you said that you walk around with the experience of of pretty much having free will. But you do too. A though, feeling I like I do. Time, yeah. Yeah. So the reason, so the reason why I guess I was saying, maybe I, I didn't explain myself super well. Then, it's sort of like I think we're all kind of susceptible to the illusion, right? Because I mean, you just—it's almost synonymous with doing things that you are like the source of action to them. Like you, I don't know. You couldn't. Maybe it's possible. Maybe there's like a state of mind that I've never experienced where you can actually just observe the, the contents of your mind completely while also doing things. But that's tough for me to do at least, right? But the thing that I'm saying is, is that it very often, almost imperceptibly, is the case that I many, many times a day I'm confronted with just the experience of not having free will. That seemed to be very different than Giffen. Right, who's who didn't you, Giffen? You didn't seem to claim that you had that latter part of my experience. I mean, in terms of the experience aspect of it, I guess I would say like I don't feel like daily I kind of confront the fact of free will, partly because okay. I haven't like read much into it. But I mean, well, sure, sure. Went on those instances when I do. I mean, I really don't really think the idea of free will like exists at all. Well, yeah, but that's that's not exactly what I think we're trying to get at, which is like because there's two there's two sides to this, right? There's conceptual arguments about could you have done otherwise or can you can you locate any aspect of who you are as a person that you're responsible for? Right. Those are almost you can call them objective arguments, but they're sort of like they're they're third person or sort of external arguments. Right. Yeah conceptual yeah then then there's the experiential side of just like you know what am i actually kind of do i feel like i have free will or do i actually feel um like i have no such authorship of of my own actions not not like the sources of the actions or anything right do you get the distinction there yeah i I mean i think to some extent i i'm not actually i'm not sure like can you possibly phrase it as a question to me let's do okay let's try an experiment like a, just sure. a little um experiment that and and harris doesn't do this in the book or at least i don't think he does but I, i've seen him do it in some interviews but basically so i'm going to ask you a question and i want you to if it helps like honestly close your eyes while we do this but but you know pay very close attention to what it's like to be you while we're doing this so just Just pay attention to what your experience is. So tell me, both of you, let's go Giffen first and then Adam, and then I'll go. Tell me the name of a city, Giffen. Cleveland. Adam? Let's just go Pittsburgh. I'm going to say Minneapolis. Now, okay. Let's do it one more time. So let's all do a different city. Again, just try to pay really close attention to your own mind right now. So, all right. So, Giffen, tell me another city. Rio de Janeiro. Adam? Uh, let's go Cairo. <laughs> Athens. Now, okay. What is, just, uh, I'm curious. What was your, can you recount for me just, just the choosing of a city? Because the first time or the second time? Both times. Um, 
right. I guess we'll go in order then. Sure. Um, like, what, what was it like to choose those cities? Um, well, in terms of like thoughts to the extent that I could follow the train, I first noticed when I closed my eyes and kind of was like sitting in like the darkness, I noticed that I was congested because every time I breathed, <laughs> it was a little bit not quite as clear as I would have hoped. Um, and then from there, whenever you actually ask the question specifically, um, I kind of like pulled up like a mental image of like the, I guess the area we're in, like, you know, a, a, a mental map of like the Pittsburgh kind of area. And then, um, although not centered on Pittsburgh necessarily. And I, I guess like Cleveland kind of just came to me as being kind of in that range that I had, <laughs> that came to me, I guess I should say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so so, do you guys agree, disagree, or somewhere in between with this statement? The experience of choosing for me was a, a pure example of my lack of free will. Because what did I say the first time? I said, what was my first? Minia Minneapolis. Minneapolis. And then I said Athens. And yeah. it's like... Why on earth did I say either of those cities? I have no idea. Like at first I thought, at first I thought Paris, the first time I was choosing, I thought, no, no, it's not a good example. Um, and then I, I wanted to make it in the US for some reason. And like, what, why did I want to do that? Like I am in no position to know. And well, frankly, I mean, yeah. I don't, I hope this isn't interrupting like the culmination of your thought, but I mean, I immediately upon like you posing the question i am thinking you might have pulled back to the u.s because i started with a city that was in the u.s um well i chose i, I chose mine before we like i had mine before we started answering do you yeah. know what i mean but 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 think about it I if see. that were true I, I didn't know yeah but if that were true like wh why would i be affected by your choice in that way like why wouldn't your choice like it, it's it's in it's impenetrable to me like if you did say a city in the U.S., why wouldn't I have wanted? To say, no, okay, well then I'll choose one outside the U.S. Yeah. You know, it's like well, that's I actually. Have... I mean, that's fair. Like I understand that it's like hard to know, like your. It's not even hard to know. I'm saying it is impossible to ever know. I, I guess I know can't... what. Why you do anything? <laughs> well, I mean, what I'm imagining yeah. here, like in kind of this conversation, is I don't know if Adam, this comes to your mind as well. Because it seems like Jordan's a little bit um, outside of our perceptions right now, but um, it seems to me that like the first thing that's coming to mind is like I'm imagining an experiment they do where like you do this, you know, you do this drill and like you know you see what happens whenever like the first person who speaks says like you know a city within the U.S. versus outside the U.S. and it, maybe that informs the probability of the other person choosing inside or outside the U.S. But I also don't know if you chose before I said what I said or not. I don't know the exact exact timeline from when Adam like decided I, on the, the city. You the to second say? one, I actually didn't choose until after I, I had just so after I, I had said Rio de Janeiro until both of you actually. I was I didn't I didn't choose Athens until after both of you had spoken. Yeah. And actually, I mean, yes. So so like, what if yours being an international city affected mine being an interna international city? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's what I think. Like, may have been the case. But again. Do do you so so it could be and it could not be yeah and and I have my experience of choosing that city is to have is to be confronted with the fact that I am choosing Athens like it's not it's not it's not any there's no sense of w in which I am actively doing anything there like I find myself choosing Athens. At the same time, you guys do. Do you know what I mean? Even if you, even if you have something in your head before you say it, like I, I, I chose Athens, then it got you know it's my turn. We're, you're waiting on me. Okay, Athens. You know. But it's but it's like the the when Athens kind of pops into my mind, it it just pops into my mind. Like I, I don't go kind of. I don't even know what it would be to to say that I chose Athens kind of freely or actively there. Like why well, I think yeah. I think I think the thing is like I don't know, like this example is just sort of like I don't know, amoral and it just doesn't have it like, definitely is. It definitely is. Yeah. It just, like, doesn't have like any conscious overriding in a sense. Like the thing is like like you know 
I don't have like any real reason to mm -hmm. like change the city except for the fact of just like preference per se. Sure. Yeah. So like I don't know. I don't like this example as much just because mm -hmm. I don't know. The thing is like it, in more consequential decisions, I feel like there's more of a conscious overriding of who I am, even though I don't choose who I am. Mm -hmm. In like and with this one, like I if say Pittsburgh like popped into my head. Like consciously, I recognize that Pittsburgh has popped into my head, but I don't really have like any reasons for changing that. Say, mm -hmm. you know, because like, I mean, unless I'm the kind of person who wants to try to get tricky, you know what I mean? Like, and wants to try to you know throw you off your game here, but and I you know don't have any choice over that personality trait. But at the same time, there wasn't really a, a like kind of a strict filter this went through. Say, okay. So if okay, I, I want to see if I'm understanding you correctly, are you making an experiential distinction or a conceptual distinction or both between picking something with kind of amoral stakes? There's nothing, you know, there's no, there's no consequences here versus a larger, very focused life decision or choice to be immoral or not. Uh, I, I think it's both. I, I think I think it's conceptual. OK. I think it is a conceptual difference I'm making there. Okay. Okay. I, I think I don't know. I I think interesting. This, I think this this example is a little too narrow to actually like. Sure. Point. It's it's so, it's an incredibly simplistic one, and I think what this demonstrates is that like we don't have any, um, we have no freedom over our thoughts that pop into our head, but I still think there's like a distinction to be made over like our conscious experience with the thoughts that simply arise in our head in our heads flush that out more yeah so like the fact that like okay so we don't have any control over the thoughts that arise in our heads mm -hmm. but then those are kind of bounced off our conscious experience in which if you know those thoughts align with who we are even though we don't choose who we are then we can act upon those or choose to reject sure. those. you know i think I don't mean to be pedantic here, but like I, I think I, I'm getting what you're saying, yeah. but I don't know. Can you choose different language to explain what you mean by thoughts kind of bounce off your... We recognize them. We recognize them. So okay. like okay. It's a recognition of thoughts as they arise. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, if they're more con like consequential, like some, some, you know, appearing like in the moral sphere, mm -hmm. instance, then you know, who I am, like, it's not like I'm simply like, you know, uh, at whim to my thoughts, like, it, like, thoughts don't necessarily like, dictate action. I think they have to go through a filter of conscious thought. So, I mean, of, of conscious experience, I mean, hmm. Retrospectively, so, like, we, we just did an active example, but I'm curious, like, it's hard to choose. I mean, I guess to each his own example here, but but when I when I kind of recall any vivid, and, and I guess maybe it helps if it's a recent one, because it might be more clear than, than, you know, early ones, but when I recall a, a decision of, like, you know, significant importance, from my, you know, just kind of we're making experiential claims here. I don't, I'm failing to find kind of the distinction that you're drawing here, Adam, experientially. Now, there's, you, there's... You've ever had thoughts that have arisen that you didn't act upon because it didn't align with who you are? No, of you, course I did. That's impossible. And you recognize nope. that? Well, like, <laughs> yeah, so no. <laughs> you're not completely like... Well, no, I, I have had that, but... Just, but just, well, I have had that experience, of course. Like, it'd be impossible, basically, to not have that. Sure. But what I'm saying is, is that I, I experientially am, am collapsing the distinction between... Because I think it, it, choosing to act on a thought has the very lack of freedom or free will that, that the thought arising has. Like, I, I don't choose, like, just experientially, like, I, I don't... I don't choose to have the thoughts that I have, but I also don't, I don't have, I mean, I, ch I choose in the sense that like, 
according to the laws of physics, you know, it, it is conceivable for me to pick up a pen or a pencil here, you know, like both of those are kind of live possibilities, but, and, and I guess that's a bad example because it, it's not, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely too heavily on the laws of physics because based on our last conversation. Of well, consciousness. so I mean, like, I, oh, I, yes. And that's also like kind of heavily involved in my argument here. I mean, I am not denying that intentions seem to be outside our sphere of conscious influence, mm -hmm. but I think like the advent of intentions and the subsequent acting of these intentions seem to like, I don't know, like belie that deterministic model in some sense. Like I definitely believe that. So Adam, not determinist. Is that accurate? I, I am, I am not a hard determinist. No. Hard determinist. As in, I buy in completely. Yeah. Yeah. We should we should explain for people these these terms. So determinist means that any aspect of any composition of who you are can be traced back. Not that we have to necessarily know them, but that there is a deterministic cause for it. So, for instance, you know, Harris lays these out, but it could be you know your genetics, your upbringing, your place of birth, your formative experiences, the composition of your body, your cells, your neurons, like everything. So interesting. So can you can you give me like, wh what would you say is outside of the realm of determinism that is not, and maybe we should get to this, but if it's randomness, that's interesting. And if it's not randomness, that's also interesting to me. I think you and I both agree that consciousness itself and just experience can't be mapped on to physics per se like one for one um i don't know what i think about the mapping um it's conceivable to me that it could be mapped which is to say correlated sure, one sure, to I, one yeah, i would disagree with my own statement there yeah okay I it, okay i yeah. don't i don't know that I, I would be against a materialist reductionist view of consciousness yeah no, I, agree, I agree with that i i, okay. I misspoke there it definitely can be mapped Okay. So, okay. Yeah. What was your initial question again? Just so I can fully understand it. Yeah, my, my initial question is because because there's the, the reason why I'm asking is this there's kind of a um, it's a relevant question when you get into the literature because there's kind of two senses of deterministic almost or determinism. Some people include randomness and determinism. I, I kind of like that way of interpreting it, and some people put randomness outside of determinism. I'm not arguing for randomness. Okay, that, well, that's what I was, I, I just didn't know where your kind of argument hinged on, because, cause, you know, uh, well, we should just, let's lay this out real quick, because it, it's not relevant to your argument, but I think it's relevant to go over real quick. I mean, ra randomness doesn't help with free will, because, you know, I, I can't remember, if you guys find the page, let me know, but but somewhere he goes over, there's this work of, um, there's there's some synaptic firing that doesn't happen in a predictive or directly causal nature. And so, you know, a lot of people think that, well, free will can be found in the random nature of it, right? It has to do with, I guess, the decaying of electron or, you know, something. It has to do with the random spin of an electron. I, I don't remember what exactly determines it, but it's random as you can get. From my perspective, randomness is a bad area to look for free will because that's merely an indeterminate, determinate cause. Right. Like it, it's do you get what I'm saying, Adam? Um, yeah, and do you agree with it? I, I, yeah, there's no way I'm trying to introduce randomness as, you know, some sort of excuse for preserving mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. all my argument. Yeah. Now, it's interesting that because Harris explicitly says on page 11 that he says it's important to recognize that the case I am building against free will does not depend upon any philosophical materialism. And I think that's good to clarify because that I, I do believe that really is a red herring in this debate because I think you can you can argue now I'm not saying any any side is right, but you can argue almost any position on free will from any consideration of of what consciousness is, right? Like I, I just don't think that that has any um any bearing on it. And one thing that I've actually changed my mind about very drastically on this topic is whether or not, it's funny, I actually got a paper published in, um, in Pitt's kind of like undergraduate journal about this, and I would now disown what I wrote in that, in that paper. Um, because with respect I, to what? Uh, yeah, so with respect to what Harris talks about on page 8 and 9. So there's this really famous study by Benjamin LeBay 
he talks about this fMRI study where the brain's motor cortex can be detected, you know, some 300 milliseconds before the person feels that he has decided to move. And so with a high degree of precision, you know, with EEG machines and fMRI correlation, we are increasingly able to sort of um, predict or see the signs of someone's intention or action before it's actually done. The reason, and, and Harris actually later has admitted that this isn't actually where the crux of his argument lies and that talking about it is kind of it's it's very persuasive to people but i'm i'm actually against considerations of this on this topic because it it actually is not related to what i'm concerned about at least because i do think it like <laughs> i'm just remembering you know when i wrote that paper it, it was almost like i i, I kind of fell prey to the assumption of just like, wow, isn't it amazing that like 700 milliseconds before you became aware of something, we could see what you were about to do? It's like, well, sure, but there's going to be correlations for anything there. It, it, it wouldn't matter to me if it were 700 milliseconds, one millisecond. It wouldn't even matter to me if it was zero milliseconds because, I mean, free will couldn't really depend on that for me. I mean, what, what do you guys think about that? Like, And, and I just, I kind of wanted to bring that up to then to move forward with not actually hinging any arguments on that. Yeah, I think it's moot. Yeah. Giffen, what do you think? I think it's moot, but I will say, I think the reason it's like included is probably because a lot of people hold like assumptions that that would kind of break for them, even yes. if they weren't well-founded assumptions. So like there's a practical yes. reason to include it in the book. That's basically it. And it is rhetorically persuasive. Um, especially yeah. to people with kind of lay pre-philosophical exactly. notions. Yes. But again, it, I'm not even sure that a negative time differential there would actually give me any robust reason to believe in free will. Um, I don't know what negative means in this case even. Well, so in, instead of... You do of something the, and then you predict that it was done? No, no. <laughs> instead I mean, I'm of, being genuine. I'm not sure what negative means. So the EEG could show that the, the brain's motor cortex can be detected, you know, it deciding the action 300 milliseconds before you report that you're aware of deciding to do it. I'm saying even if that time differential were reversed, that would be surprising, but it wouldn't be evidence for free will. Because whatever whatever you think is giving you that kind of whether it's a ghost in the machine or whether it's a soul or, you know, whatever you think it is that's giving you that, that intention before we can even pick it up. I mean, that doesn't give you free will either, because I think as Harris says, you know, um, on page 12, uh, even if the human mind were made of soul stuff, nothing about my argument would change. The unconscious operations of a soul would grant you no more freedom than the unconscious physiology of your brain does. I want to push back on this a little bit. Okay, so... From the perspective of we don't have souls, but if we did, we might have free will? Yeah. Okay. So like let me think of like a thought experiment here. Okay. Okay, so what if what if we, you know, created beings with, you know, individual personalities and moral compasses and then let them just kind of operate within a world and they were completely free to operate as they are. So they didn't choose who they are, but they can operate as they are. Like, is that, is that explain to that me? Seems, yeah, that seems yeah. honestly equivalent to saying they will operate as they are. As explain to, to me how you're viewing that as different than our circumstance also. I'm not. What this is like, this is kind of like, <laughs> this, this, is, this is how I'm viewing things. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So like, I, I don't know, like, I feel like given the freedom to operate, like, as who, like who you are in a sense mm. is free in itself. So... So I think you don't I choose think, who you are, but you're free to operate as you are. In one sense, I can see what you mean, but in another sense, I, I think I strongly disagree. Um, because I don't understand what it would mean to be free to operate as you are if every individual instance is just kind of is is like I said, the experience of kind of finding out that you're going to do something as you do it. 
even when I am, this goes back to what we were talking about before, but sort of if I, if I think about something that's really important to me that I deliberated over for a long time, sure. I can't, I can't find any instance or example, uh, within that, because obviously, you know, making a difficult decision is a long process. You know, you think through the pros, you think through the cons, you think of who else it will affect. Um, you roll the dice. <laughs> <laughs> you think of yeah, you roll the dice, you factor in your horoscope, you know, <laughs> um, right? But it's 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 you know composed of all of these micro kind of instances. But when I look at any of the micro instances, I'm I'm kind of confronted with the same thing that I'm confronted with with the city example, like the fact that I care if choosing to save for grad school at a certain rate will like I do the calculations and I find that if I go at this rate it should give me enough to to you know with a stipend sustain myself for this many years you know it's like all of that I don't know why I do that calculation right if in fact I do it and if I make a mistake in those calculations I don't know why I made a mistake and like I don't really I think I think you're kind of like arguing now that's kind of like a red herring at this point like doing calculations not sure. right versus not. I mean, we're talking about like making decisions, not whether your brain can function properly. You know but what I'm I mean? saying? But any part of that decision, when I look at it, I don't see the freedom there. Even down to sort of like why I even value, like why, like you can ask that question of almost any part of that decision. Like, why do I want to go to grad school? It's like, it's I, I can tell. Well, of course, but do I have any free, like, freedom over that i wind up a toy it flips like it's who it is almost well it's it's and and i i see what you're saying and i'm not what i'm saying is there are still and this is i think the 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 series will kind of move in this direction i'm not making a lack of a distinction at all i'm not saying that like all of my decisions fall under the exact same um, conceptual bin like there are conscious and unconscious things that I do do you know what I mean and there are also distinctions to be made where I make thoughtless decisions and decisions that I think about for a really long time and like give heavy you know thought to but I don't experience free will in any of that I mean you're stating that you know like what? I I mean, you kind of like, you made the argument and then just kind of like threw in at the end that you don't experience any free will. But I'm saying that like, Mm -hmm. it just depends how you're viewing free will in this sense. Like you guys, I think, I think you guys are kind of like negating the fact that um, like acting as you are Mm -hmm. in a sense is free in itself. I mean, like I honestly can't conceptualize any other conception of free will that I had before that than, you know, like would I act you know, differently than who I am. I mean, I don't think anybody has that idea that you're going to act like. No, that that would be precisely the case of like, I don't know what came over me, you know? Yeah. So it's yeah. like most people are under the impression that, okay, it's like you're going to act based on the kind of person you are. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and the thing is like, I, you know, if you spend, you know, months at a time thinking about this, like kind of mauling over important decisions, eventually like, you know, your actions will reflect who you are. And in a sense to me that like there's some real free will associated with that. I don't see free will associated with that, honestly. Hmm. Like, (laughs) I don't know. Wouldn't it be the case that you're just then conforming to what you happen to be, which then there's no, there's no basis of free will any, anywhere there either. It's like, you kind of said, you know, like you're, you're acting upon it, right? Like you, you've done things corresponding with who you are. Yeah, of course. But the, that is not sort of the very point. I mean, none of us can, can own any part of why we are who we are, you know? Sure. sure. So, but then acting, I, I guess I don't understand what it means then to kind of, I, I'm not understanding where the free will is emerging for you or maybe f- like some type of freedom, but it's not free will. Well, I would say like the there there certainly is like definitely a freedom to being able to act out who you truly are, even if who you truly are isn't mm-hmm. in your even though you don't choose who you truly are. 
Adam, you're like phrasing things in a way that I'm like, I'm not 100% certain of like the argument. And I know this is kind of difficult to like uh, form the most appropriate language for. But you, you're like, you know, at least I am who I am. But I don't like who you are, who you are. Like you have the freedom as who you are. But I honestly don't see that as much of a distinction as saying like, you know, the like the I mentioned this before as like a kind of toss away. But like if I wind up a toy and like it ends up flipping three times before like, you know, the the wind crank kind of like stops moving. It's like, oh, you know, like it is who it is. Like I don't where does like the choice come in at all? Like I kind of feel like almost a wind up toy. I mean, you know? can, I, can I can I expand like yours a little bit, like what you just put out there? Please. I mean, yeah. Say so you had infinite knowledge and you were able to like design a being that had like its own moral framework and then send it on its way out in the world at that point. Sure. And then that being that encounters situations where thoughts would arise in its head sure. and then it would consciously recognize those thoughts sure. and then, you know, act upon based on who it is. Like, you don't think that like that being in any sense has like, you know, just like a certain like freedom to act upon who it is. Honestly, if I had infinite knowledge, I would say that would completely eradicate it all from my perspective because i i think a lot of like our well not not infinite knowledge that my entire argument did not hinge on infinite <laughs> well you started it with infinite knowledge I, 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 adam I, was trying to sneak in that he is yahweh let us say for a moment children I'm friends I please please okay you had a lot of knowledge okay and you designed to be like i do not want the argument did not hinge on infinite okay. knowledge no, that's good to know, Adam. I'm glad you clarified that because the first thing you said, I was like, okay, well, I can definitely roll with that. I, <laughs> I was, I was like, if I knew that, knowledge, I mean, not, honestly, it's not the crux of the argument. I just have a super, super high level in the far future, right? Of like knowledge of you know human brain states. Let's just kind of rest it at that. And I am a like we're at a point where we're able to actually like kind of create, you know, to the best of our like knowledge or understanding, like conscious, you know, be behave like creatures that behave as if they have consciousness, you know. Um, whether that's like the to the extent of an elephant or like a, that of a human being, whatever, right? Um, and you like set up like in some sort of either an experiment or a um, simulation, okay? Like that's the, our degree of knowledge is so high that we can simulate a lot about like our world, orders and orders of magnitude beyond what we can do now. And you kind of set up like a kind of construction, right? It's like inside the simulation you have a, you know, like the the creature's fully functioning brain or whatever, right? And you kind of set up every, like, molecule by molecule, quark by quark, you set up in, with all the rules in place that we were aware of, right? You set it up to, like, this one instance, like, maybe it's, like, reaching out its hand towards something, right? Like, the creature in the simulation, right? You hit play and see what happens. You go back and you try it again. The same exact situation, hit play, see what happens. Go back again, hit play, see what happens. Um... I'm kind of, and this is a kind of like, I guess, getting at determinism. <laughs> at a certain point, it does the exact same thing every single time. And if it does the exact same thing every single time, even if it is behaving to the best of our knowledge the way it, like, like, like we would, right? I don't see how there's like choice in that. Like, I think there's a certain yeah. uncertainty that comes with us not knowing anything close to that amount of knowledge about physics or like biology. And that kind of is like a haziness that, you know, you could project free will onto. Um, but I don't actually see, like, if if I was infinite, I know this wasn't part of your argument, but if I had infinite knowledge, you know, or like infinite power or something, you know, like from this moment, if it kind of was stopped, you know, played, roll back to the exact same physical state, play again, the exact same thing happens millions and billions of times over every single time. And Which I don't see how... the sense of could have done otherwise. Yeah, so could have, and the, like you saying, like the creature could have done like, you know, gone to the left versus right. To me, you're basically like making the argument like, well, based on my knowledge, like I didn't have enough knowledge to know whether it was going to go left or the right, but the way things were, it went to the left, you know, whatever it happened to be. Yeah, so based on like, I don't know, like the framework you described there, I probably wouldn't disagree with anything, but it just for me, like I think listening to you kind of, I don't know, showed me why we disagree. Sure, just, sure, just, just in the sense that like, I don't know. I think there's like a very non-deterministic way that, you know, thoughts arising in our heads interacts with conscious experience. 
And I'm just like really not sure that like that's deterministic in any like uh, in in any fatalistic sense in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, I'm using uh, fatalism wrong here, but I'm just saying like it's not determined necessarily how thoughts arising in our head interacts with conscious experience. I have a question. I, I think it's determined, but Jordan, I want to hear what you have to say. I, I well, this this is going to flesh out whether it is determined for Adam or not. So, a Adam, if if we're using just like some person as an example, and they have like a thought arises, they didn't they didn't choose to have that thought, but they you know they kind of mull it over, it bounces around their head, it reflects off consciousness, right? And then they act upon it in one of two ways, or you know what what, what I guess one of infinite ways, or something like infinite ways, just many ways, right? If we rewound the universe to right before that thought popped up and then hit play again, are you saying that something could have come out differently? Maybe. Okay, see, I have... Ab uh, that. Okay, then I very adamantly disagree with that. Well, yeah, no, I don't. I don't think I do. Oh. But if it were to come out different, that doesn't give us free will. Because the only thing that I can conceive of is some change that that agent has no control over anyway. Well, I grant you that if you kind of reset the physics of the thing, you know, the world into that scenario and then hit play again, the same thought arises. Yet, uh, you know, it, uh, random spins of electrons could determine that neurons fire, you know, differently we're, each way. We're, we are excluding randomness here. Well, then not, I have no idea what lies outside uh, that bound then. So it's not... Anything physics. that we can, it's yeah, it's 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 like it, it, that. We're approaching some sort of weird soft dualism here, unless we're not. If we have well, the same exact physical like parameters of our universe playing over and over again, and you're excluding like random quantum mechanics as playing a role at all, like do you, where's the maybe? Just, just, just to clarify, this is not, you know, this is not your point here. But I'm not excluding quantum mechanics, right? Like this is just, I'm saying it's not. But isn't that randomness? Yeah, I thought that was just. I'm, I'm saying it. I'm saying it doesn't hinge on the argument that I'm trying to make here. Oh, you're you're admitting that it exists, but that's not where you're locating the indeterminacy. Yes. Yeah. I don't where, know where I that I I'm genuinely for me and curious. Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's like if there's like if there's indeterminism, it's because like. Our, to the extent of our knowledge of physics, like there is like randomness at the quantum level. But if you're saying like your argument doesn't hinge on like the randomness, we can just say like that means you admit that. Like I don't know where like you can say that like take away randomness, but I, admit I, yeah. that it like you can play it over and over again and something different happens that doesn't Adam, have an I'm, answer. In, I'm oh, very it was confused now because I I was about to explain how I thought we disagreed and it's not how we disagree apparently. Well. I, I guess, to be fair, though, I think you guys have kind of backed me into a corner where I think I've been made to say things that I'm advocating for. Rather, I haven't fully bought into determinism. So it's like I think it's like okay. I, the distinction is really, really important here that I've pointed out that I think there is a really important interaction that, you know, uh, that conscious experience brings into it. And Maybe I said things that maybe don't align, such as things could have happened differently. I don't know. Maybe maybe they couldn't have happened differently if, you know, mm. any randomness is taken out. Then maybe it just naturally follows that things would have happened as they are. But at the same time, like, I, I feel like I've been pushed away from the original argument, my original intuitions here. And I'm not necessarily advocating for any sort of dualism, but I'm not advocating, but I haven't fully bought into determinism either. I think that's where I'm at, okay. right? And you yep. mean, so we're, we're referring to determinism as all possible causes plus randomness. And you yeah. haven't fully bought into that. Yes. I am failing to understand why. And I'm curious because I don't know if this it's obviously impossible to know because now we've had this conversation, but like, it seems odd to me that you would say that on most other subjects. Right. But sort of like, because you're wanting to maintain, um, some sort of freedom, then if that's the conclusion, it almost bites the bullet of that conclusion. Do you know what I'm saying? 
I know I would disagree. Like, I mean, I wrote like entire notes, like based on the reading here of like, you know, thoughts that popped into my head. And, you know, I gave some considerable thought before this. So it's not like anything reflexive here. of any yeah. design. I wasn't saying like in this conversation, it was no. the piece of paper that says like blorange. <laughs> what popped into my head? Blorange. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm a little confused, actually, because at first I thought, I, at first, I was going to try to clarify what you were saying by saying you're not arguing for any sort of libertarian free will. You're heart honing it on some sort of compatibilist sense. But now it seems like you almost are. I mean, the indeterminacy part seems to be edging closer to some sort of libertarian free will. Well, I'm definitely trying to push those boundaries a little bit here. I'm definitely trying to push the envelope because I'm like, I'm, I'm, I kind of want to push you on this a little bit. It's like, yeah. it seems like you're saying that the freedom that oxygen atom has with a carbon atom you know like that the influence it has on the world it, it's actually not so different than us which is just a collection of different atoms but you're saying that like the freedom that that individual atom there's really no difference between that and the collection of atoms that we are the influence we have on the world well, yeah that, that's generally the argument you're making here um it's it's that's sort of the um the external or third person argument but I'm saying also you can witness your sort of your lack of free will subjectively and we don't know what uh, theory of mind is true yet. Do you know what I mean? No, but, but you, you got to go with my you can't kind of pivot it there a little bit. I'm saying that like that is what that is the, the claim you're making, though, right? I'm, yeah, I'm saying determinism plus randomness. I can't understand a yeah. cause outside that. Adam, what do you mean by influence on the world here? No, that, that's a really good, really good question. I think that's kind of like what I'm kind of stuck at. I think that to some extent we can actively like if I have like a conscious thought in my head, I want to pick up my like this bottle right here. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's I don't know why it appears in my head, but I can have some, you know, influence upon other things in the world like that. You know, I, I can actively shape the world. And I, I certainly feel that human beings or conscious creatures definitely have like the ability to actively shape the world around them. And I definitely don't. And I feel like there is like a fundamental difference between that and just simple chemical reactions. But wouldn't you agree that the ability that we have to shape the world around us is indistinguishable from a third person perspective from just some purely mechanistic way of, of affecting the world like if if we just had some you know boston robotics robot and it just like you 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 coded it to pick up the bottle like it's affecting the world in the same way you can and we're not really tempted to ascribe free will to that because in this case we actually know that the command came from outside yeah. the robot right and this works even if you add complexity like this robot starts dictating like policy proposals right it, it had that's a large influence on the like even the human world. Yeah, no, I that would that would that would put to rest any question I have ever had if we could actually have a robot where we knew thoughts emerged and then the robot then kind of differentiated between those, weighed the consequences, you know, the pros to this one. And then, you know, I mean if we could build something like that, we were sure those attributes my, that yes. My argument actually didn't require the thoughts to emerge in the robot's head. It's just like, you know, plug-in inputs and outputs come like for policy doesn't require thoughts just to be clear it's the idea is that like you put in like you type into the computer or whatever and then suddenly it's like you know 15 percent tax rate gradually in, like increased to 20 percent it's like what it like on these following like commodities like, something like that like the reason i bring it up is because putting a you keep like mentioning like influence on the world but you're like you know moving the cup up and down it's like I don't know if that's like a small influence and you're saying like humans can like change all of society. So I was bringing that up as like maybe the robot, like you, you put it in and it has an impact on society that way. It wasn't actually hinging on whether it had thought. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't I don't know here. I mean, it's like the the works of Shakespeare. I mean, are these you know, did these emerge from just simply, you know, just simple chemical yeah. reactions coming together? You know, yeah. I. Um, the works of Shakespeare just emerge on their own. Adam, you made a distinction that I don't recognize as existing between you said, you know, a thought arises. And of course, you know, we don't choose that thought. It merely arises. And then 
you said, I can't remember your exact terminology, but it sort of bounces off consciousness, it reflects off consciousness, it's shaped by consciousness, right? Something like that? Yeah, it interacts with conscious experience. And then it's sort of, for lack of a better term, output or sort of um, inhabited as an action or as a kind of complete decision, like, yes, I will do this, and then the action follows from it or something, right? Yeah, I mean, if if who you are, you know, through your conscious experience has this. Yeah. 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 Okay, so the thing that I am, and I'm glad that I'm finally understanding us, because the thing that I do not find a distinction between, and I'm curious to hear why you find a distinction, is between the thought arising and then this, what you're calling like modification of through consciousness or like kind of reflecting off of it or, or intermingling with it that I don't understand what you mean by that. That's just more thoughts to me. Like, and I'll give just like kind of like an example. So like, let's make it like, let's make it count. Cause you, you wanted to make it moral. Um, yes. let's pretend I'm in a store and I see something that I want, but I do not have the money to purchase it. And, um, I also see that I would likely not get caught if I stole it, right? Sure. So the thought arises, I want this thing, whatever it is, right? A new jacket or something, say. Sure. And then the thought arises, well, you know, that would be kind of immoral to do. Many, many thoughts arise, which is, you know, if I'm actually debating it, I look at the exit, there's no one there, there's a changing room, I can go and put the jacket on underneath what I have on, right? And I'm, I'm kind of thinking about this, you know, well, no, you know, this, what kind of person would I be? It, it, all of the subsequent deliberations there, I'm failing to find a distinction between that and just more thought. Like, in the case that, it, it's like, because it, it, you say, I mean, you, you act kind of you don't you don't determine who you are but but you act as you are and that's where the freedom lies but but acting as i am is comprised of just a totality of thoughts that i didn't choose like and whether i did whether i settle on one action or another is itself just it just arises it that intention arises like a thought i mean i'm i don't i'm failing to see a distinction there so i think my distinction would be this like the fact that like one thought like once it arises in conscious thought so it is just not it's not subconscious of that you're recognizing that it's there yeah yeah and at that point any thoughts that arise after that were influenced by that thought so like in, in yeah. those enter conscious thought where's so, the freedom there i mean <laughs> where's the freedom i mean it's those thoughts at that point you know reflect who you are yes yeah but you of course they do free. but but where's the freedom there yeah because uh, i i think you're i think you're kind of biting a bullet you don't have to here um because because i i think that you can still make the distinction of like (sighs) any given action can be representative of who you are or not like there are like we've all like uh, help me think of an example here but like we've all done stuff that's uncharacteristic of ourselves you know maybe you're a really frugal person and you make kind of a rash impulsive buy and that's not really like who you are as a person right but you did it in that scenario and you did it precisely due to your lack of freedom. Like even if, and if it, and if it is the type of like, you know, you're a frugal person, you see something you really want, but you're like, "Ah, you know, like I'm, I'm saving up for grad school, paying off my loans, whatever it is. And you don't do it. But freedom does not exist in either of those scenarios or free will does not exist in either of those scenarios, but we can still maintain that distinction. Hmm. I mean, I understand. Well, I, I've understood like from the very beginning where you guys are coming from, but I don't think you guys have ever fully understood the subtlety of my argument here. And, like in, in kind of like in just like when discussing like the difference okay. between I I, yeah. I I I think this would have to be like a, a part two so I can actually write out like a real thesis here because I feel like unless I'm wrong, it has to be something in this where you're maintaining a distinction between a thought arising. And then the conscious interaction with that thought. And I'm saying, but if you think about it, or maybe notice it is a better word, that's just more thoughts. When you they say happen- conscious interaction, you're just saying thought again. 
<laughs> Actually, it's a kind of a good point, Giffen. Yeah. Sure, but like I think that was like the difference there was that with Jordan's initial city example, mm-hmm. like we we mainly focused on like the initial thought, the initial randomness that sort of just emerged. But I'm saying that subsequent thoughts after that are then influenced by that thought because like you have now a conscious recognition of thoughts in your mind. So like any thoughts that come after that are then sort of a reflection of who you are and the ability to think and then act on who you are is in itself freedom. So that seems to, okay. That what you just said is very much a compatibilist idea, not a libertarian idea. But then you're adding in indeterminacy, which I don't know why you're doing, because I don't think you need to, to preserve that statement. And that moves you closer to some sort of libertarian argument. So I'm, I'm confused we'll, because... We'll yeah. throw out the second half then. We'll throw out the second half. But because... not if you don't actually be, like, believe it. Do you know what I mean? Like... No, because that, that's, that, that's one vein we went down in yeah. which I had no model to describe how things could have been different. But it never hinged on where I started. So I'm happy to throw out that half. But So you're no longer advocating for any sort of indeterminacy? No. Okay. Then I understand your project more, but you're not I just <laughs> you're not throwing it away for argument's sake, right? You're you're actually disavowing that in in what you hold to be your position now yeah i mean like I'm, I'm happy to disavow that because i i didn't i mean i think we we all kind of arrived at that position and honestly that's not one i held before entering this argument either we okay. arrived at that point no problem things couldn't have been different i'm much clearer now because now i understand i understand the framing to the argument now okay okay so what i'd like to finish this episode with is gif and figuring out because we never fully closed the loop because we got we got caught up in you know Adam's position for a long time there but sure I if we can I just I want to figure out where if any of the distinctions are between you and I um, yeah sure I'm not I mean hopefully you're going to be willing to do some of the work there because I'm not trying <laughs> no, to know the distinction I, I, so I'll, I'll be happy happy to carry the load for us because I <laughs> I, I'm not sure. It seems it seems um, that that uh, conceptually, at least, we very much are of the same mind so far. That's not to say that we might differ on on the subsequent episodes. Yeah, I um, think that's fair. But I, I wanted to return to that experiential side of things. So what what did you make of um, what I was saying about sort of it being? Um, a lack of free will all the way down, even through sort of the most consequential decisions, you can actually just witness yourself. F- you, you witness yourself kind of arriving at the answer when you find out what your answer is. Like there, there's no freedom anywhere experientially. I don't know. Um, there, I think there might be a little bit of a difference because whenever I like think, whenever you posited that, I'll I'll just explain my train of thought, and maybe you can kind of flesh it out from there. I was thinking like. Well, I mean, it's true, like kind of instantaneously at the moment, like it did appear, but like I can at least like upon reflection associate it with like, you know, previous environment or previous thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure if that has any bearing, but like, for example, like whenever we whenever I said Cleveland as my answer for the city that appeared in your head, I know I think we actually talked about Cleveland a few times like last night. (laughs) I guess the only thing I'm really claiming is that upon reflection, I could see how like previous events or previous like we can even just say like externally like just the environment yeah. could have informed my this like the decision that i that was made i should say um whenever mm-hmm. i spoke um that's that's basically all i'm kind of bringing forth okay so if you i understand you that. correctly <laughs> <laughs> so if i understand you correctly and this might be where we do differ then sure so you're saying it's sort of able to you're able to um in the past sort of see your lack of free will, but that you can't actually kind of in real time experience yourself as not having free will. Is that closer to correct? I mean, I don't really know what constitutes experiencing a lack of free will, frankly. Like I I think I get like only a gist. I'm just not like 
certain enough about what you mean to like give like a yes. It's kind of like a, I see what you mean. It's like, like Cleveland popped into my head and it's like, I didn't feel like a sense of it. Like it popped in and that's basically like it. I don't know if that is like what constitutes experiencing a lack of free will or not. Yeah. I mean, if it every, does, then it is. If it doesn't, then it, it isn't. Well, it's every, it's just every part of everything you do. I mean, like, so, so let's go back to the consequential one. Cause that seems to matter more. Like sure. you're deciding whether to kind of spend something um, frivolously spend on something frivolously. Sure. Right. You know, and it's, and you're kind of all of these, if you just kind of just just imagine what it would be like um, to do this. It's kind of going to be a, just like a flood of all of these different considerations. And all of those will, will pop up and you'll deliberate about them. But that deliberation will be individual instances of just popping up, of, of weighing them differently. And yeah. then you'll come to a conclusion. And even that conclusion, that the conclusion will just kind of pop up, for lack of a better word. Um, yeah. And... I guess I'm just curious and I can't answer this because I, I don't know what you experienced per se, but like, I, I don't know if, um, if you're agreeing that retrospectively that makes sense, but that when you're actually doing something, you're for lack of a better word, kind of caught up in the doing of it. And, and, it, and, it, and it, you're almost embodied in like a feeling that you're, you're actually authoring these agentic maneuvers and that it's only in retrospect can you see well of course these were all just instances of a lack of free will <laughs> um i guess that's i i still am honestly like a little bit uncertain like mm -hmm. i because can you, let's give go like a, with a yes or no question maybe like whenever i am like in the moment it's like cleveland popped into my head um without any kind of sense of like i will thus like think <laughs> it's inconceivable of, you know what would you yeah like, yeah you so, would have I mean, to so, think it before you thought it <laughs> i mean yeah so that's i mean yeah. is there like is there at that point after me having said that is there still uncertainty from your perspective about like what i believe or is there like another question you can ask subsequent to that to like clarify two possible beliefs i could have at that juncture yeah um i'm not sure at that point I, I am just unclear of whether you are are able to. Um, eh, it, like, I mean, maybe this helps. Like, I'm not consciously yeah. aware of my lack of free will in every single moment of every single day. Yes. Like, I mean, no, not, no, obviously not. I don't pick up a piece of toast mind. and I'm like, good lord, the lack of free will is overwhelming. Like, <laughs> you know, like I, I don't know if that actually. I'm, I'm being genuine. No. I'm not sure if that's what you mean because you seem to be like every kind of moment I reflect is instantaneously associated with a lack of free will or like a knowledge of lack of free will. No, but the moments in which I'm not aware of it are almost distracted moments for me. But I do live like everyone does 99% of the time in those distracted moments. Okay, okay, okay. I understand. Yes. Okay, okay. Um, all right. Well, I'm, I, I think unless there's anything pressing um, for the rest of this episode, I think we can end it here where... I think we've done a good job of sort of laying out the issues at hand. We will be sort of moving into areas of, of compatibilism on deeper issues. All right. Well, I hope this was, uh, was enjoyable and, and interesting for the listenership. So uh, thanks for listening and tune in next time.